I, I always geek out when you do that when you hit the side and it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so awesome. I'm wondering when you shoot a moment like that, are you hitting it in an exact spot? I know it's CGI, but you do eventually do wear that mask. Yes. How does that? Do you just sit there all day and do that? <laughs> I do have, uh, and it is a specific spot because behind my ear, you'll see I piece. have this little piece, and I think that connects to what I'm assuming is some sort of like nanotech. Uh, helmet device, so like all of that nano, all those nano molecules are inside of there, and so I can hit that, and and it, and the mask comes on. It's so often, like when I'm doing giant stunt sequences, that's the one thing I forget to do. <laughs> so I've blown some massive shots by just not doing this before I do oh. uh, uh, a, a run and fly off. I'm yeah, like, do the thing. Cameras move, pan, $100,000 already wasted on this <laughs> shot that I, they're not going to use because I forgot to do this. <laughs> James was just telling me this. I'm like freaking out. This is so cool. That there is a separate script that him and Vin have for the translations of what I am Groot means. So, yes. So in your script, all you see is the I am Groot. And how do you know what it means? Is that the whole point of it? Like you kind of don't know? or? Well, I think it's part of the point. And oftentimes, you know, as, you know, as the joke reveals itself, Oftentimes, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the character that he's with whom he's speaking reveals what he's just like heard. Like Rocket. Like Rocket yeah. will say it, or I'll say it. Like, you know, often, you know, it's kind of like uh, when you see in a play and someone picks up the phone and they're having a conversation, but you can't hear what's on the other end. You have to kind of fill in the blanks. And so a person will be like, Tom, yes, Tom. <laughs> well, sure, I can be at the airport at 8.30. Why do you ask? Ah, oh, because you're down at the airport right now. You know, like, you know, you kind of, fill in the other side because the audience doesn't know and I think that's like kind of some of the fun that we have with that joke with I Am Groot is because he'll say he says well one of the greatest lines in the movie so I better not spoil it now but he'll say for instance uh, I Am Groot this is a very meta joke in the movie and I don't think I'm spoiling too much he says I Am Groot he says don't call me a raboon he says I Am Groot raccoon whatever <laughs> <laughs> so it's so random. It's so random and, yeah. and and yeah, it's pretty absurd. I know you've been asked this before, but I'm genuinely curious. Have you? Is there a translation for what's on your shirt? Because I I, I know you said that there was, and it's an actual language, and someone probably does. But have yeah. you have you asked James? Does anyone know like what's I on? I want to. I don't know if this is true, but I want to say it says gear shift. Gear shift. Why? I, I don't know why, and I don't know if that's true. That might have just been something that someone was speculating on Twitter. It might say gear shift, but otherwise, it's. I think it's a, a language, and I think it's a candy brand from some piece of candy that was in the first movie. Huh. The logo that the props department and the art department made on that piece of candy, James really liked the aesthetic, put it on my shirt, so it's almost like I'm wearing a Reese's PC shirt. Like It's like an ironic space shirt. You have this in insane, absurd action, the space fight scenes, and you have all these characters and the music. But the beauty of it is there's actually a solid, amazing emotional core with these realistic people that you care about. Yes. And I'm wondering, like, you know, there's a great scene at the end of the, uh, the trailer when Kurt Russell walks out and says, I'm your father, Peter. And I thought that was a, re and your, the reaction on your face, the internal quality of what you go through there is incredible. Yes. I'm wondering as an actor, as a father yourself, do you have to think about, like, being a father and how that moment plays out with you? I know it's not a, it's fiction versus nonfiction, but right. do you think about that? You know, I think, you know, um, for the most part, when you're doing a scene like that, the main, the, the first avenue into creating an authentic moment like that isn't always going to come from empathy. It's always going to come from truly trying to feel what this person must be going through, hmm. this character that you're playing, what they must be going through. And oftentimes that's enough. Just having empathy, just, just putting yourself in, in, the, in a person's shoes and feeling the feelings that they must be feeling in that moment. Hmm. Oftentimes that's enough to get you to a place that you need to be emotionally, but sometimes it's not. And in that case, there are various techniques you can use. Substitution, you can like, uh, you know, use music, you can use like breathing techniques, you can do, there's a ton of different ways to get there if you can't get there just by using a natural empathy within your heart. All right, so I really want to see Snake join the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like, what do you think he would do in that group? I, I feel like he, that'd be... he, unfortunately, <laughs> Snake would care, could care less about <laughs> any of them or any of the things they do or who they are. He just wants to get further away from the galaxy, right? <laughs> if he could, he might want to steal one of their spaceships and try to figure out how to run the thing. 
and ram it into a plan and get rid of himself. I mean, you know, he's a different guy. Someone you call know. John Carpenter right now. And get, <laughs> we'll do like a crossover. You know, though, that years ago, I did think that it would be, and then nobody would listen to me. I thought it'd be great to sort of take a bunch of the characters that guys, that, that the guys that like Bruce Willis and Stallone and Schwarzenegger and whatever. Like the McJohn McClane. They all had yeah. one. They all had one best character. Yeah. That I thought would be interesting in 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 the sort of uh, actionary world. Um, that I thought it'd be fun to put those guys together. So um, that would have been a, uh, a realistic version of what Marvel did, <laughs> but uh, it was it was like talking to a wall. Okay, that's <laughs> it was uh, a little ahead of its time, I guess. That to me next time. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, it was like let's go that. back 30 years yeah. and you know what? Try it again. I'm gladly yeah. green like Because I thought it would have been cool. I thought you could, you know, and, and let them be the characters that they are. So, oh my God. and my thing about that was is that I, if I was going to be Snake in that, I was going to say, well, the only problem is is that I'm going to I'm going to have to produce the movie because the only thing Snake's going to do is walk. And look at him and go, I don't think. And leave. <laughs> <laughs> Please get this made. Somebody needs to make this. Uh, I don't want to give too much away where this is in the movie, but there is a, a scene where we see a younger version of you. And I'm wondering how that was done because I've seen filmmakers do that. I saw them do it with Downey Jr. in, uh, in one of the Marvel films. This looked incredibly real. It's really interesting to hear you say that because we assumed that we would use the same techniques. Yeah. And I've been told, to a very small degree, they did. So they were prepared to do that. When you do that, you put dots on your face for, so they can, they, they know, they've got uh, points to, to uh, uh, go to. Yeah, Bridges did it for Tron. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, they've done it right. My makeup man's a guy named Dennis Lydia. We've done 28 movies together. Our first one was Tango and Cash. Which the one. <laughs> He was a 24-year-old kid. First nudity I ever saw in a movie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. Yeah, and, 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 but by the way, if you're referring to me and Sly, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It was the, it was, it was the girls. It was the girls. Not even Sly. Yeah, it was, it was a lot the girls. Of girls yeah. Yeah. So Dennis said to them, um, look, I know that you're gonna, what you're going to do, what you're going to do, but I, can, I know his face really, really well, and I can bring him down a lot, and I got some tricks in my bag that I can use. Would you like me to do that, or do you just want to put dots on him and go to work? And they said... Let's see what you can do, because anything that you can do can help us. So he went to work, and when he finished, I looked in the mirror, and I said, i got to take a picture of this and send this to Goldie and the kids, because I said, this is unbelievable. I put the wardrobe on, got the hair going, and I said, Dennis, you're some kind of magic man. You, you, well, how did you do this? And he said, nah, you know, just the stuff. And uh, that's primarily, that's Dennis Lidyard. That's Oops. not, that's not quarter of a million dollars worth of CGI. And from what I've been told, they said, yeah, we used a little, but not a lot. Looked unbelievable. Yeah, he's really good. It and really and um, what can I say? Yeah. It made me believe that if there's things to do in the future where I got to do some flashbacks, we can do it. That's some cool For stuff. For a couple of weeks, anyway. <laughs> now, now we'll have to do a snake prequel when he's a kid. You know, oh, well, we you know <laughs> it's, it's interesting how uh, cameras and light we also didn't, by the way, um, we didn't do a great deal of lighting tricks to help that. And if we did, if we would have done that, I think we would have been even further. Wow. We would have gone even further. Now, you, you've you worked amazing in sci-fi environments before. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the thing. It's a masterpiece. Carpenter's an absolute genius. And I'm wondering, like, you know, obviously this is a, major, a completely different environment, but you're still dealing with the sci-fi quality of, of characters. And I'm wondering, like, you know, what you learned on that set, and do you have specific stories of what Carpenter did there that you kind of still use now in the sci-fi world? Well, I, I, I agree with you. I think that John's just got it yeah he just he just has a vision of the world that that fits in the things that he a lot of the things that he did and I was fortunate enough to be in some of them um I don't know and I don't remember if John and I spoke of these things but I'll bet we did because we spent a lot of time together but sci-fi allows you to do things you can't you just can't do in other in other genres mm. ask big questions and in this one the opportunity for me was to play yeah. Ego, the living planet, who's created his own world. He's created himself. <clears throat> He's gone to Earth and made the dubious decision to look like this, right? <laughs> to go through that experience, to experience everything as a, uh, as a human. But being a god, as it were, it asks the question, well, if, if he is a god, which he is, then what's, what's Peter Quill? Who's, mm -hmm. who's Chris Platt, Pratt playing? That would be a you know to to allude to that in a, in any other environment in any other genre would be just stick out like a sore thumb, sore thumb. Here it 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 
it make it's like it, it makes works. you it makes you ask that. Well, that's really interesting. Mm. What what po- what powers does Chris have? What does his character have? If this guy could do that, what can he do? Mm. And I think that's the what's ama- amazing to me is when you put that on, on a level of relatability of a kid who's never seen his father has created someone in his imagination for him to be. And a father who's never seen his son has always wanted to see him and has been looking for him and probably has created an image too. Mm. Uh, when you finally get it together, you face reality. So you're gonna fall down and you're gonna exceed mm. and the two great degrees. Yeah. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you so much. That was a good talk to you. All right, so I'm genuinely curious with Vin Diesel playing Baby Groot this time, does he change his voice at all in the booth or does he do it in the actual Vin Diesel voice and then you change it? Uh, no, he's, he does a Baby Groot voice and that's most of what the voice is. And then we do a little bit of, of messing around with it because Baby Groot is a little bit s- smaller than any human being. But yeah, it's mostly Vin. And then how, when he comes in and does all those lines, does it take him a couple days or does he do them all in one day? Because there's, there's not that many of them. He does so. it all in one day. Yeah, he, he works for one day. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. But he still does it a thousand times. I wonder he's, how much money that is per word. <laughs> it's, it's like it's it's a lot, but I mean he's he really you know it's not like he's 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 he gets paid, but it's not crazy. One thing I find interesting though, I remember talking to Vin Diesel for the first one, is that he told me that in the script it would say I am Groot, and then there would be an explanation of what it meant. Yeah. So how 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 does that work in the script? Do you put like sentences about what it means? Cause, no, cause, just for Vin and me. So I have a special script for me and for Vin that says what I am Groot. Instead of saying I am Groot in the script, it says exactly what Groot is saying cool. so that he knows all, all of what he's trying to communicate. I've watched behind the scenes footage of Bradley Cooper. It's amazing. And I'm curious though, with the camera in his face, how much of the smiling that the raccoon is digitally doing is actually coming from his actual smile? I was 90% of it comes from Sean Gunn, from my brother, because he plays Rocket on set. Most of the physical acting is Sean. We get Bradley's recording mostly so that we can use it for the lip sync of what he's saying. Um, but most of the acting comes from Sean on set. How did you find, how did Bradley find that voice? Did, did you guys work on that together? Because I mean, when I first saw the movie, I didn't believe it was Bradley Cooper. It sounds yeah. nothing like him. Yeah. So I'm wondering how, you, how did you guys find that voice together? I think, you know, we talked early on. We had a couple of conversations on the phone before he was even hired to do the first movie. And we talked a lot about Joe Pesci and what Joe Pesci was like. Huh. Uh, we talked a little bit about how I saw the character, how I saw him talking. I had a pretty you know, distinct idea of what Rocket sounded like. Um, and uh, and he would do different voices for me on the phone. I'm like, yeah, I think like that, like this, like that. So that by the time he came into the recording booth, the first time around, we had a pretty uh, a good idea of what he sounded like. Mm-hmm. But I think Bradley has found that voice a lot more on the second movie than on the first movie. Yeah. It took a lot more tries on the first movie. Second movie, he came in and just kind of nailed it. One thing I think you do so brilliantly in these films is this balance of soundtrack and score. I mean, Tyler Bates is uh, amazing. And yeah. then you have this amazing soundtrack. And as a filmmaker, those are both leaders leading characters in your movie. And I'm wondering how you balance those two out and how, when do you know you want to use soundtrack versus using score? Well, it's, it really, I just go off of my gut. I mean, all the songs are written into the script, so I know where all the music is. You know, we write most of the soundtrack, the score before we shoot the movie so that we can play all the music on set and and, and film to it and the actors can act to it. Hmm. Um, so it's all very baked into the movie itself. But I think I just go off gut in terms of when there's songs and when there's not. You can have, you can, you know, have it, all of a sudden it becomes a jukebox and not a movie. Yeah. And I don't want it to ever get to that. Point. Now, I know there's five post credit scenes. I watched all five of them last night. I'm curious at what point in the filmmaking do you know those five are going to be post credit scenes or are they always written in there as post credit scenes? Uh, all of the five post credit scenes were written into the script except for one. One of them was not. One of them I came up with afterwards and I was like, oh my God, that would be hilarious. And so I, I, I went and shot it after we had already completed the movie. We did it in you know, post shoots. One thing I was, I was watching the credits last night, I loved how some of the credits said, I am Groot, and then it would switch to the person's name. Yes. How did you choose who got that? That was kind of a cool little thing you did. We chose people based on people who were, who we knew, who we actually knew, so that it huh. wasn't some, so we knew it was somebody that would like it and not somebody who was, you know, somebody who was working in England that we didn't know on the visual effects or something. That's awesome. I think what you do, it's amazing to watch the 
chemistry in this film and the music and everything that you do, but the way you shoot it is incredible. And I'm wondering, like, cinematography-wise, like, it, it really, it, that, that becomes a leading character as well in the way yeah. you move the camera. But you have this brilliant, single, continuous shot during the credits of the movie. And I'm wondering, I, mean, I know you can't go into all the details, but how did you pull that off? It looked phenomenal. It, it's when, it, it took two years of planning to do that single shot. It God. was a long time, so it was... You know, and it's a combination of real stuff, real shots. A combination. A lot of it is just pure CGI. Mm. Um, that's me dancing as Baby Groot. So we shot me dancing as Baby Groot. <laughs> really? Yes, and, and we use that as the template for Baby Groot dancing. So it's a <laughs> lot of different parts that have to come together and and uh, and 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 do it all to the music of uh, ELO. And it, it was it was a really complicated shot. Probably one of the biggest visual effects shots ever, if not the biggest. The last thing, I love your brother in the movie. I think Sean's awesome. I'm yeah. just curious, when he's on set doing ra the rocket, yeah. what does he look like? Is he in dots? Is he like is he, is he he like hunched over like like Andy would do, like uh, Gollum? Yeah, he's hunched over. Sean has the ability to squat and walk around like a crab on two legs, which is one of the reasons why he was hired, because he could be the right height for rocket. And he wears, when he's rocket, he just wears this gray suit. Unfortunately, his role as Kraglin was a lot bigger in this movie, <laughs> yeah. and Kraglin is with Rocket all the time. So a lot of times we just had to have him go over in his Kraglin outfit and squat <laughs> and do the lines, and it becomes very confusing when you're editing it together because the first cut of the movie has Sean as Rocket in it. So it's, I'm like cutting together Rocket with Kraglin, but Kraglin's dressed as Kraglin as Rocket, and it gets very confusing, but Dude. it ends up being okay in the end. That's awesome. It was an honor talking to you. This was uh, worth just flying from DC oh, to talk thanks, to you man. again. Thank, Thank you. Now, I do want to ask you, there's an epic shot in the film when you're running up and you slice <laughs> that monster down. And I thought it was so cool, and I'm wondering, I was watching some of the behind the scenes. You actually were leaping. Yes. On, can you talk about shooting that and how you actually stay in character when you're going that high? How do you... Pull that off. There's there's a lot of things going on in my mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is please don't fall, don't kill yourself. Two is um, leave a good impression <laughs> with everybody that's around. I think that because also like I'm a female, I love seeing the expression on men's faces when I get to pull something off. Yeah. Especially like the stunt team, they tend to be super rough and very tough, and and um, you have to as an actor you have to prove it. So I I it's a it's a boost. It's a really good boost to, for my confidence when I get to do like stunts that I can get away with. But I'm also happy sitting it out and allowing my, my stunt woman, her name is Leanne, uh, do just the, the bigger, scarier, more aesthetically beautiful yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, challenge. There's a really cool one. I'm not, I wasn't sure if it was you or your stunt person because it looks so good in the movie where you're running and like the red dirt's like being exploded behind you. That was you. me. That was that real. Was I sick. wish Leanne did that. <laughs> I tried. I was like, can't Leanne do that? And they were like, no, the camera's in your face. I'm like, <laughs> but that dust. And then, I mean, and we did it more than a couple of times. And there was one take where I guess the, the thing misfired. So it was blowing up ahead of us as oh. we're running. I mean, that take was hysterical because we're like myself and the two camera guys, we're like stuck in like this storm of like red dust. And I'm like, where's everybody? It was that crazy. That is awesome. Now I was watching you, I think it was on Kimmel the other night, we were talking about the Hulk thing with your kids. That was really yeah. funny. But I'm curious, like, do you ever like get to wear the makeup home? Do you always take it off when you leave? Like, do you ever like go home um, and surprise your kids with the no, makeup? No, no, because it's not something I can just wash off in the shower. Sure. We need like really special strong chemicals to like, like throw on my skin so that I can start melting away all of that paint and prosthetics that I've glued on. Wow. I, I wish I did, but it's not. But I would love to. I would love to be able to one day, because I, I see that a lot of the actors uh, of you know of, from all these superhero movies get to dress up in their costumes and go visit hospitals and go visit and spend yeah. time with children. So I, I would love, would love, would love to do that with my kids and be dressed as Gamora. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Now, we were geeking out about like all the filmmakers you worked with before the interview started. James Cameron, obviously James Gunn. I mean, it's amazing. It's an, and J.J. Abrams. I'm wondering, like, do you pull things from each of them? Like, for example, like when you're working on a set like this with James Gunn, do you think about something Cameron taught you on Avatar or something you learned from Abrams on Star Trek? I mean, is it, is, does that happen? Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, the one thing I learned from Avatar, I, th I think that Avatar for me was my game changer. Mm. You know, I was, I was relatively unknown, this girl from Queens and I was one of thousands of girls that submitted a tape and, and James Cameron, you know, chose me to play Neytiri. And then 
that that research that that um, coming of coming into Neytiri for five months that I did from archery to working with martial artists to horseback riding with no saddle to um, working with um, uh -huh. a Cirque du person to learn how to like walk like a Navi given the fact that they had a, a fifth limb which is their tail I mean, it, w it became I went to school I felt like I had gone to the University of Acting and it took it all the way back to that vaudeville kind of thing where I was able to incorporate my body and my mind and everything and I walked away feeling so alive and so happy from that experience that I've, I've tried to carry it on in, the, in every other character that I play in every other movie and, and, and submerge myself into the research of it. I do have to know, do you geek out on set? Because like the scene when you had that gigantic missile thing in your, and you were like firing it. All the it, time. I was like, this is freaking awesome. I had like nerd tears. Like, do you geek out? How does like, when you shoot a scene like that, what are you, are you holding something that makes it? Yes, but, but it's also, it's very heavy. So there's a rope holding and a wire holding the weapon. And um, and I'm also being held by something so that I won't fall because we're we're working on a set that's really oh. not really leveled and dangerous, mm. and I'm just shooting and and there's <laughs> these lights blinking at me and explosions going off all around me, and every now and then I just I have to ruin that one take because I have an out of body experience going. You're here, like you're this. You're living your dream, and you're you're inspiring people, and it's it's kind of fantastic. All right, so first of all, I, I love the idea of the, of the character whistling. I know that's a part, been a part of the character. And I'm curious how you found that specific whistle that you do, and was that something you discussed with with uh, James? Like how you found that specific one that he does? We had a, we had a few different whistles, and so uh, and you know uh, me. Uh, I can do either any of the whistles, but uh, you know I had the the teeth in, so the oh. teeth made a big difference. I had to relearn how to do some of the whistling. Yeah. So the one you use yeah. is be is because of the teeth and the way it comes out. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, would, do you have to go back into ADR and do whistles again in ADR? I did. I didn't have to. No, huh. we, we we made the whistle, and they 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 enhance the whistle. They make it a little bit more alien like and yeah. more. Um, that's awesome. That kind of cool. Worked out pretty good. Now, for Eyeline, I mean, I, I, those scenes when you were throwing those into people, it's one of the, I was geeking out beyond belief. And I'm wondering, what are you seeing? I know there's CGI, obviously, but what's happening? What are you seeing? Does he give you Eyeline of what's happening? Are you watching like a pre visual of what occurs? It, dear, I mean, during the. Uh, when it's going through people, like, you're, yeah. Yeah, we're watching. I, I'm watching it, yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm also um, uh, changing the whistle, too. Uh, as as it's going, sometimes he had me. He had me um, uh, do real short little bursts, and then long whistles, and and then we and then we uh, we did the melodic whistling. You not not too often. We did that a few times. Yeah. But uh, that's more like like pre, you know, <laughs> pre. Arrow flying stuff. So I was telling you, I'm a big Mall Rats fan. The chocolate covered pretzel moment in that movie is iconic, <laughs> and I'm just curious yeah, yeah, how yeah. many times you actually did that handshake with Jason with the chocolate covered pretzel. Like, did you guys have to? Do he that? wanted to do it a lot more than me, but you know, it's, it, you know, because he's a little, he likes torturing. <laughs> <laughs> but was it like, I mean, how many times, how many chocolate covered pretzels did you guys have to use for that? Was it multiple? Like you're you doing it over and over? We did the, you know, we did the take a, a few times. <laughs> you know, a few times. I love that movie. Yeah. It was delicious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you notice there's a cut in between getting the pretzel and yeah. then bringing it to my mouth because, look. <laughs> you were going to say. I, lo I, I, I love my fellow actor, but. <laughs> Unless I see him absolutely wash his hands right before doing that with that pretzel. I'm <laughs> putting it in my mouth. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So we had, we, there was a cut in between, and then I had it, the pretzel, and it was still melty and gooey and yummy. And, yeah. You know, I, I love I loved the, the ultra close-up of the oh, taking picture. Oh, God. It, like, make, it horrifies me. So I watch. It's one of the funniest things. Now, one thing I love about Drax is his laugh. I mean, his laugh is incredible. And I, and I think one of my favorite moments of the trailers recently and in the movie is when, is when you're laughing at Chris Pratt when she tells him about his love for Zoe's character. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, uh, do you have to just sit there and do laughs all day? Because, like, there are a lot of them in this movie. Like, you, yeah. like, j like does the script just say Drax laughs? Like, did you, do you add those in yourself? How does that work? No. Well, I usually, you know, I, I go by the direction of James and, uh, you know, how he usually wants my laugh, you know, really big. And, <laughs> 
Um, but no, I just go by his direction, and sometimes, and now, because of the, we learned on the first film that I can lose my voice from that laugh. <laughs> really? So he's very, he uses it very sparingly, and he'll say, you know, just, you know, do a half laugh, do a silent laugh, or sometimes <laughs> I'll just, you know, just mime it. Uh, but then he'll say, just go for it, and then, you know, just, ah, because it's really loud. It's like me screaming <laughs> at the top of my lungs. Do you have to do ADR laughs? I have, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's so, like, the stuff you, I think, I don't know if people would ever imagine the, the ridiculous stuff you have to do in ADR, like make, you know, just make it, you know, motion noises, a grunt. You sometimes have to go in a booth and go, rrr, 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 rrr. <laughs> really? <laughs> and it's so ridiculous, but that's how they, you know, feel. Because a lot of times, especially when you're doing action stuff, they, they just can't pick it up. The sound won't pick it up because it just happens so fast. And there's so much movement and there's so much other stuff, fans blowing everything that's going on. Sound just can't pick it up. So you literally go into a, to a booth and you go, <coughs> or you just run. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. There's that epic shot of you diving into that monster's mouth, which right. is so cool. And right. I know there's CGI involved, obviously, but I'm sure. wondering when you do that shot, right how it looks for you uh, when you're doing what, what are you leaping off of? I was leaping, so I was on wires, and I was leaping into a great big green screen. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really weird because you wouldn't think that it would take so much, but I mean, we shot that over and over because James was, was really specific about how he wanted me to look from behind. And every time I thought that I was big and spread out enough, it was well, but it just wasn't big enough. So <laughs> went like on and on for hours, and you have to kind of contort yourself into these weird positions, and the kids are really uncomfortable. <laughs> and the harness for the wires, is, it's yeah. it's horrible. Like it puts things in places they shouldn't be. Yeah. It's really horrible. Do you have to get out of it and chill for a little bit before? Like uh, I usually don't. I we, you know oh. sometimes if you have to be in it all day, you'll loosen it up. But once you get it, because it takes a whole costume removal, you have to literally take everything yeah. off and put it on and then to put it back on. So yeah. It just loosened up during, you know, between takes. Now this is like, I'm sure, you, I know you've been asked this a million times about the makeup process and how long it takes. I'm just curious what the day looks like. So you you get there, what time, yeah. and then the, the actual process of the makeup going on, yeah. then off, how long is your total day? Well, like typically we would, you know, shoot 10 to 12 hour days. Um, you know, and it's not uncommon to go over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so to a 10 hour day, turn into a 14 hour day real easy. But, you know, for me, my makeup process went on really fast, so I didn't have it that bad. Um, so my, it only took about an hour and a half to put on, so I wasn't, you know. Even I, all the grooves and everything. That's yeah, crazy. My, my my makeup team is, I mean, just no joke. They're some of the best guys in the world. Um, so they just really, you know, they really took care of me. They got the process down. They knew it was an uncomfortable, long process, and I was also there for a long time. Um, the girls, Zoe and Karen, by far had it worse. Karen's is ridiculous. Karen's is crazy, and she, it was not uncommon for her to be picked up at two thirty, three a.m. in the morning. And her to just sit there and fall asleep in her chair. She did it all the time, uh, and we understood. We totally understood why, because she was usually the first one there. That's insane. Yeah. Hey, it was really good to see, you, man. Yeah, thank you so much for the interview. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Okay, you. man.